All right, everyone. I'm here with Mike Humer. How you doing, Mike? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing really well. I wanted to have you on because um, you wrote one of my favorite books of all time, The Problem of Political Authority. And uh, But before we start getting into talking about some of the themes of the book, why don't you tell everybody um, you know, a little bit about yourself? Okay, so I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of Colorado. I've been there since 1998, so it's been like 20 years. Um, I got a PhD from Rutgers University. Um, I've published uh, articles in philosophy journals, like about 70 articles in um, ethics, political philosophy, and uh, epistemology, and a small amount of metaphysics. And uh, I have six amazing books that you should buy. <laughs> and uh, you should you know, just look me up on Amazon and buy all of my books. Question. Did you, have you done a TED Talk? Uh, I have a TEDx talk, yeah. A TEDx talk, okay. Or two of them, actually. I saw one of them. So, yep. Yeah, I was I was like, I'm like, wait a minute. I think I, it just occurred to me. I'm like, wait a minute. I think I saw his uh, one of his TED Talks. Yep. But, okay, cool. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the problem of political authority, let's just jump jump into that. Yeah. When you look at America and you look out at the population, the overwhelming majority, I mean, <laughs> probably 99% believe that the political class are an authority, that they are legitimate and that they are to be listened to and to be obeyed. So what's, yeah. what's the problem with that? Yeah, well, uh, well I mean, the only problem is that that's false, I guess. Um, uh, so, I mean, so I think that's basically true about people's attitudes. But also, if you, if you talk to people, they can kind of sense that there has to be some kind of reason for that, right? Like... If you ask people, okay, and so why do they have authority? And nobody thinks that that's just like a foundational fact that doesn't require any explanation, right? Uh, and so then when you just start asking about what the, what the explanation could be, it just turns out that there is no satisfactory explanation. There is nothing about those people in Washington that makes them special, right? They're, they don't have any characteristic that explains why they should tell everybody else what to do and we should have to obey them. When you started developing your thoughts on this, did you were you at all influenced by uh, Lysander Spooner's No Treason? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, so I think that what I say is very similar, but I think that's just because it's a natural thing to think if you're, uh, you know, if you're of a questioning uh, spirit. Now, do you teach any of this um, in courses in college? Yeah. So. I, uh, I do it all the time, yeah, and um, you know I think it goes pretty well. You can't really tell what students think because uh, when if they know what the professor thinks, they just say that, right? Because <laughs> you're the so, authority. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe right, but I'm a legitimate authority. Um, yeah, so but uh, fortunately, I don't claim political authority, so I don't uh, use violence against people to impose my will on them. What do you think is the best way when you're talking to people about political authority that you've seen to um, open their minds up and get them thinking? Well, so, so I don't know if this is the best thing, but what I do is I just describe, you know, in class, I describe some of the things that governments do and some similar things that you could do while not being a government and what these things would be called. So if you... Uh, go around threatening people in order to get their money. You do this on a regular basis, collecting money from them um, involuntarily. If you're not a government agent, we call this extortion or theft in general. If you are a government agent, we call it taxation. Um, for another example, if you uh, if you're trying to bring about some kind of political change, and the way you do this is by blowing up buildings and killing people. We call this terrorism if you're a non-government person, but we call it war if you work for the government. Uh, and uh, if you force people to work for you, they call it national service if you work for the government, uh, or slavery if you're a non-government person, right? And so then, you know, I just ask people like, so what's the difference between all of these things, right? Uh, and there doesn't appear to be any relevant difference, right? The only difference in these actions appears to be 
you know, the ones that sound horrible are done by anyone other than the government, right? And the ones that people accept are done by the government, right? But there doesn't seem to be any other explanation, any other difference that explains, um, you know, why one set of actions is much better. Yeah, if somebody in Texas decides to burn a church down because they don't like what they're teaching, um, that's wrong. But if yeah. government agents decide to burn a church down because they think they're a threat to their authority or they've overstepped the quote unquote law, yeah, that, that seems to be perfectly fine. And it, it it's very telling that people will fall in line with that too. The you know, the, the overwhelming majority of the public will be like, um and not will not only back the government, but will justify what they did. Yeah. So, and by the way, so even people who are uh, um, against a lot of government actions will not treat them exactly the way you would treat a private citizen who did this, right? So, uh, if you meet a private individual who has blown up buildings just on his own initiative and killed people because he thought, you know, they were a threat to the country or whatever, uh, you would get away from that person and you would view them as a murderer. If you meet somebody who worked for the government doing those things, even if you're against the policy, you wouldn't react to that person like they're a murderer. All right, so like it's, it's kind of, it's very pervasive that there's a very different attitude towards government agents doing these things. And, uh, you know, by the way, some of the, when I was doing some research, um, you know, I found the Obama administration's justifications for some of their policies. So uh, they had the, you know, this drone strike program where they were assassinating people. And there's actually this document where they they wrote up their legal explanation for why this isn't murder, right? <laughs> because, you know, without some explanation, it's just a violation of the murder statutes, right? Like they send the drone and then they they blow up somebody and that person is dead. And like, if I did that, I'd be charged with murder. So, um, right. But, you know, their, yeah, their explanation was, you know, something like um, the wartime exception, right? <laughs> uh, that is, when they send a drone strike, that's part of a war. Even if the drone strike is on um, a civilian target and even if it's not on a battlefield or anything like that, right? Um, so that's kind of questionable. This is a direct quote from your book. You, you say the best approach to political philosophy involves reasoning from common sense moral judgments. Um, yeah. Do you find, as time goes by, that people seem to look at morality more subjectively? Uh, I, so I don't know if that's increasing with time. I mean, there, so... If you ask people on a sort of theoretical level, what they say is different from what appears to be implied by their ordinary everyday attitudes, right? So if you ask people if there are objective values, a large number of people will say no. I, I think most people, okay, but they won't act like that's what they think. So, you know, like if, uh, if their boyfriend cheats on them, they will not act like, oh, you know, there's no moral facts so whatever. It's just it's all just subjective opinion, whether that's okay. They will act like that was wrong and like it was really wrong, right? So and it's kind of hard to say what ordinary people's belief is, right? Like there's sort of their stated theoretical belief, but then there's the belief that is sort of implicit in their attitudes and behavior. And in your ordinary everyday life, you don't act like there aren't any objective values, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, th those same people are very inconsistent when they uh, try to question whether, you know, say, oh, well, it's immoral to kill people. It's like, well, you know, in a lot of like real postmodernists um, will say, well, th you know, that's that's a statement that can't be proven and everything. But then, you know, in their personal life, if somebody, you know, if somebody they loved actually got murdered or something like that, um, I doubt that they would be applying that uh, that same metric to um, you know, their situation. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, you know, you might like what the what the subjectivists say when you raise this is something like, oh, well, you know, it's just that I don't like murder, <laughs> right? I dislike murder very strongly. It's not that it's objectively wrong or anything, right? But, um, yeah, but, you know, I mean, they're, they're, 
if you come up with any sort of implications of the view, um, it doesn't look like we follow them. Right. So if is there any is there any practical implication to thinking values are subjective, like you shouldn't impose them on other people? But nobody believes that. Right. Mm -hmm. Like nobody believes, oh, let's repeal the murder statutes. Um, or what about this? Like if if we just change our attitudes, then things that are wrong will become right. But, you know, you don't think that. Right. Like, oh, there's this world hunger. It's really bad. Why don't we just change our attitude so that it's not bad anymore? Like that's going to be the easiest way to solve the problem, right? Yeah. Nobody, nobody thinks that, right? We don't act like that's a way of making it not bad anymore. Yeah, I heard this. Um, somebody had brought up to Kim Jong Un that um, you know he has concentration camps in his yeah. country, and he said, "No, we don't. We don't use it because that term doesn't exist in, in our language." <laughs> <laughs> I see. I see. Yeah, that's um, a confusion between words and reality, I guess. Right. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to move on to one of the more, if you are a libertarian and an anarchist, one of the more annoying but frequent um, terms that is thrown at you, and that is the social contract. Yeah. And, and you describe the social contract in your book as it's a theory that hype. Uh, hypothesizes a contract requiring citizens to obey the state and the state to protect the citizens yeah. it, uh, is uh yeah. what it's that sounds good i mean that that, yeah. that that sounds you know legitimate because there you know there's a lot of boogeymen out there there's a lot of people that want to kill you so um you know what yeah, well there's a few people <laughs> <laughs> um, but a few is enough to be a, to be a big problem yeah yeah. So, um, how is this? How, yeah. What's the problem? What's wrong with this? this? I mean, so um, you know, periodically, I I mean, I should mention that this is a big improvement over the theories that people had before that, right? Because of, before the social contract, um, like what people like John Locke were arguing against was things like the divine right of kings, like. Oh, the king is descended from Adam, the first man, and that means that he gets to tell everybody else what to do. Okay, that's a really bad theory. <laughs> um, and the social contract at least implies that the state has an obligation to you to try to protect you in return for taking your money and stuff. Um, the only problem with this is that it's just factually false. right? Like we just never made such a contract. Nobody ever offered me the contract. You can't like show if there was such a contract, you know, somebody should be able to just show me the paper with my signature on it. It's not there. Um, you know, what's usually said is, oh, well, we agreed implicitly, right? Like we didn't have to explicitly write it down. It's just sort of implied in our behavior or something like this. Um, the problem is that this like it just doesn't satisfy any of the conditions that a real contract satisfies. Right. You can't just like declare that there's a contract just any time. Right? So, um, you know, in ordinary life, I can't just like go up to somebody and declare that they've agreed to give me some money and obey my will by living in their house. Right. Like just because you're living in your house, if you stay there, you're agreeing to obey my will and give me some money. Uh, that would not be accepted. <laughs> like, you know, no court in America would accept that as the basis for a contract between you and me. Uh, and that's basically what the social contract theorists say, right? Like, oh, yeah, you know, if you if you don't accept the social contract, you have to, like, move out of your own house. You have to leave your own property. Everybody has to va vacate their own property and move to Antarctica if they don't want to agree with this, right, to obey the will of these 535 people in Washington. Right. Uh, yeah. Nobody else gets to do that. Well, I think one of the interesting things about people who throw around the term co social contract is that, you know, if you ask them about any contract that they've ever signed, you know, it, whether yeah. it be, you know, say they're renting, renting a house and they have to sign a contract, there are explicit rules on there. There, there are steps to get out of it. There are penalties for getting out of it. Um, there's always a way to get out of a contract. Um, yeah. But both sides always have 
obligations yeah. that must be yeah. carried out. Um, you know, the yeah. the whole thing about the state protects the citizens, that part of it, it's like the the courts have judged, you know, just one that I always talk about, Warren versus District of Columbia, 1981. The police have no right to protect you. No obligation to yeah, protect no you. Obliga yeah. I'm sorry, no obligation. You're correct. Um, yeah, I mean, so it's... And then you throw that out there and it's like, well, I know a police officer and and you just get into the they start <laughs> trying to go away from the whole, you know, what is a contract? And then it gets into yeah. feels and things like that. So, yeah. So, you know, when I say this doesn't satisfy the conditions of any normal contract, right? Um, in contract law, it's like it's undisputed as part of contract law that if you have a contract, both parties have an obligation to the other. If one party reneges, then the other party doesn't have to do their part either. Um, so, okay. So the, the state should have some obligation to the citizens. Traditionally, the obligation is supposed to be to protect them from criminals. Some people think there are additional obligations. Okay. But if they have any obligation at all, then you should be able to ask. So what happens if they don't satisfy it? And in any other context, everyone would agree if you break the contract, you have to pay compensation. The, the other party might get out of the contract or something like that. Okay, so what happens if the government doesn't protect you? So if there is a social contract that violates it, so then the government at minimum has to pay compensation. But of course, as you, as you pointed out, they do not. Right? And there are multiple cases, right? Um, starting with the Warren case, but there's multiple other cases where people tried to sue the government for not doing their job, right, for not doing the government's job, and um, the courts just go, no, the government doesn't have to do anything, right? <laughs> like, they they don't have to protect you, right? So, like, in that, in the Warren versus District of Columbia case, um, these women called the police because someone was breaking into their house, right? And um, basically, just the police never came to help, right? They called twice. Um, and then the women were beaten, robbed, and raped because um, the cops never came to protect them. Right? And like there was a long time, there's a long period of time during which the cops could have come and helped. Um, and then the courts just said, yeah, but you can't sue the police because they don't have an obligation to protect you in the first place. Okay, now, and, you know, you might just think, oh, so that was an incorrect decision on the part of the court. But the thing is, like, the court is an arm of the government. So that means that the, the government's own position is that they don't accept any obligation to the individual. And if you're in, the, if you're in an alleged contract and the other party says, I'm not accepting any obligation to you, that means that you don't have to accept any obligation to them. And so, so we wouldn't have any obligation to obey the state. You'd said in the book that there is no way of opting out of the social contract without giving up things one has a right to. Can you explain yeah. what you mean by that? Yeah. So, you know, you can take hypothetical examples involving like, you know, contracts in ordinary circumstances or agreements in ordinary circumstances. So uh, you're working for this company and, you know, the the um, uh, company manager says, oh, okay, we're going to have a meeting, you know, next Wednesday at nine o'clock, right? Does everyone agree? And, you know, if you don't say anything, maybe that could be taken as agreement, okay? But imagine that the manager says, okay, so if you don't agree, please signal that by cutting off your left arm. That's the only thing, that's the only thing that I will accept as a way of signaling that you don't agree with my proposal. Okay, that's not valid, right? So I can't declare that, you know, to not – it doesn't matter what the, what the thing is, right? I can't declare that in order to not agree with some proposal I'm making, you have to cut off your arm. Um, now, and you might think, okay, well, that's because like, cutting off your arm is really horrible. But um, it could be anything that you have a right to. I can't demand that you give up anything that you have a right to as a way of signaling not agreeing to some proposal I make. So, like, I can't say, hey, uh, you know, you have to come and mow my lawn. If you don't agree with this, you know, signal that by giving me a dollar. Right? I can't do that either. So if you don't give me the dollar, that doesn't mean that you agreed to come mow my lawn, right? And a dollar is like a trivial amount of money, but the thing is, it's yours. So you don't have to give it up. 
uh, even if you don't want to agree, okay? So what happens with a social contract is that, um, you know, when people try to defend um, the social contract theory, they say, well, in order to not agree with a social contract, you have to move to Antarctica, right? They usually don't put it like that. They say you have to vacate the territory controlled by the government. But every habitable landmass on the Earth, every landmass other than Antarctica is controlled by governments, right? So when they say you have to vacate the area controlled by the government, they're basically saying move to Antarctica, okay? Um, well, you can't demand that somebody move to Antarctica in order to not agree with your proposal, because what you're doing then is essentially demanding that they give up, you know, if, they're, if they own land, you're saying they have to give up their own land and move off their own land, right? Which is like, you know, a lot worse than demanding that you give me a dollar in order to not agree to mow my lawn, right? You can't demand that they give up anything, right? <laughs> like, you can say, you can demand that they just tell you that they don't agree, and like, that should be enough. And you can't demand that they um, undergo enormous costs, like, oh, now they have to leave behind their family and friends. They have to quit their job. They have to leave all society and, like, live out in the wilderness by themselves with the polar bears. Like, yeah, that's not a reasonable way of opting out. One of the things that you mentioned there was that if you would leave, you would be giving up property that you own. Somebody, yeah. may, somebody may come back and say, well, you hate government. The only reason you have that property is because government's there to protect it. Yeah. Well, um, you know, maybe, maybe not, right? <laughs> well, they're there to steal yeah. it if you don't pay your property taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, so according to anarchist thinkers, um, you know, including myself and Murray Rothbard and David Friedman and so on, that, uh, well, there could be ways of protecting property without relying on the state. And this is usually just ignored. Um, basically, you know, most believers in government have no idea. They don't have the slightest idea what an, what an anarchist theory is. They think anarchism is just the idea that you should have total chaos and like no attempt to protect property or whatever. Okay, but um, so it's true that the government is protecting our property rights. Uh, they are also at the same time preventing anybody else from providing that service. So if I try to set up my own police force to enforce rights and like, you know, collect, collect money, if I try to do the same thing the government is doing, uh, the government will, will then come and shut me down forcibly, right? So it's, it's in that sense that um, the reason they are the only protectors is that they won't let anyone else protect people's rights, right? If anybody else tries to do the same thing, they shut that person down. So, um, okay, but so if I am providing a service to people and I'm forcibly preventing anyone else from providing the service, like I can't really claim that now other people owe me money and obedience because I'm providing this service, you know, that I'm forcibly stopping anyone else from providing, right? Um, if I'm stopping anyone else from providing the service, then I'm just obligated to provide it to people. And I'm obligated to give it to them, you know, even if they don't agree to pay me a bunch of money. Right. So, you know, an example I have is, um, well, if somebody – so there are a bunch of, um, you know, sources of food. If I stop you from getting food from anyone other than me, uh, then I have to give you food. And I have to do that even if you don't agree to pay me. Right. Because, you know, it's my fault that you can't get it from anywhere else. Can you talk a little bit about um, the theory that some people have of hypothetical consent? Yeah. So the theory is, you know, after the social contract theorists realize that nobody has actually agreed to the social contract or, you know, nobody has voluntarily agreed, nobody had a choice, then they turn to this sort of hypothetical scenario. Well, OK, it's true that you didn't actually sign the social contract. And the government was already there when you were born. But hypothetically, if somebody had asked you and you were reasonable, you would have agreed to set up a government. Right? So like if a whole bunch of reasonable people, if they didn't already have a government, reasonable people would have agreed to set one up. And so therefore, you should act as if you, would, you have agreed to that. Okay, now, I mean, there are some circumstances in which this sort of hypothetical claim is valid. So um, if you have, a, you have an unconscious patient in the hospital and the patient needs medical treatment, 
okay, normally you have to get a patient's consent in order to treat them. Even if the treatment is necessary, right, even if as a doctor you know that the patient needs this treatment, you still need the patient's consent. But if the patient is unconscious, then it's okay to go on the basis of what you think they would say if you could ask them, right? Then you can say, oh, well, they would agree to life-saving treatment if they, if they could, if we could ask them. So, and then you can go ahead. Okay, so you might think this is like the social contract, you know, people haven't actually agreed, but they probably would agree. Um, the problem with this, though, is, you know, you can't appeal to the hypothetical consent if the person is conscious and you could ask them. And the only reason you don't want to ask them is that you're afraid that they would say no, right? Then you can't appeal to the hypothetical consent, right? So there's no reason why the, the IRS can't actually ask people if they consent. Like when they send out the tax returns every year, there could be a question on them that says, hey, do you agree to have the federal government? And, you know, if no, then enter zero on line 48 or whatever, where this is your total tax liability. Okay. And why are they not doing that? Uh, because a whole bunch of people, if the result was that you didn't have to pay taxes, a whole bunch of people would say, no, I don't agree to have a government. And then they wouldn't be able to collect as much money as they want, right? Okay. But this is like a doctor saying, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and perform the medical procedure. I'm just going to like, you know, gas this patient to put him under, even, even though I could ask him, because I'm afraid that he might say no if I ask him if it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's, that's a really good explanation, a really good, uh, a really good example. That's awesome. Can we move on to what I like to call the tyranny of the majority and um, democracy? You know, one yeah. man, one vote, 51%, 50.1%. Yeah. Um, I mean, if if you have common, if you have people to share, you know, a common culture or a common belief, um, that sounds pretty reasonable, doesn't it? Uh, well, it depends on what the belief is, right? <laughs> you know, this, re this reminds me of the recent um, story in the Babylon Bee, the satirical online uh, news site where they say, you know, there's, um, um, the Nazis have come up with this new democratic Nazism, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, don't worry, we're only advocating democratic Nazism, right? And, uh, you know, that reminds you that actually, you know, Nazi Germany was a democracy, right? Or Germany was a democracy at the time that the Nazis took over. Uh, yeah, does that make it okay? Okay, now, um, uh, so, you know, the question is something like, suppose there's an action that would seem to violate people's rights. Like initially on the face of it, it looks like it violates people's rights. But then you find out that there's a number of people who want to do it, which is greater than the number of people who don't want it to be done. Does that make it so that it no longer violates rights? So obviously not, right? Hmm. Uh, in fact, that obviously doesn't make any difference at all. It doesn't make it okay. Uh, so, you know, if there are five people, there's like a group of five people and four of them want to murder the fifth one, is, does it become okay? Because it's like a majority. So no. Now you might think, oh, that's a little bit unfair because I'm using the example of murder and the state rarely murders its citizens, right? Um, well, you know, it, I mean, it can be any rights violation, right? It could be a trivial rights violation. So there's five people, four of them want to take one dollar from the fifth one and the fifth one doesn't agree. Is it... Is it ethically permissible to take the dollar because there's more people who want, want to do it? So no, right? It could be one penny. Right? The four people don't have the right to take the one penny just because they're the majority. But th they can just call themselves a government and then it's all right. Well, you know, that's, you know, that's the way that it looks, right? But, you know, what, what is going on, you know, just because they're calling themselves the government? How does that make it okay? Well, what about voting? I mean, you know, I, the great thing about the United States, from what I've heard, what I was taught in school, 15,000 hours of <laughs> government indoctrination, was yeah. that um, the, probably the greatest thing that um, the United States has is, you know, your vote counts. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, sort of, right? <laughs> so I, it's true that they count all the votes, right? But 
when people say that, it seems like they're implying that your vote will make a difference, or at least there's a reasonable chance that it will make a difference. Uh, everybody knows that that's not true, right? I mean, everybody knows that the probability that it will actually make a difference is negligible, right? So how many times have you cast a vote and that decided the outcome? Like all of the other voters were tied and then your vote, you were the tie-breaking vote. How many times has that happened? Um, well, it's it's not going to happen in your lifetime, okay? Now, um, you know, it is... So, like, you know, to be fair, democracy is better than what we had before it, right? <laughs> like, all these things that I'm saying, like, you know, the thing that the thing that we have now, the status quo, is better than the stuff people had throughout history before that, right? But it's just, you know, we have we have further to go to get to justice, right? So, the fact that we get to vote, um, it does eliminate the worst abuses, right? So, like. Um, uh, dictatorships frequently have widespread famines where people are literally starving to death. Um, they frequently go into unnecessary wars, just like attacking other countries, and then the people get bombed by the other country, and like millions of people die or whatever. Uh, and that, you know, doesn't happen so much in democracies. And yeah, you know, because at the very least, the voters are at least able to detect that famine is bad. <laughs> and, you know, bombs dropping on your city, they don't like that, okay? The problem is, um, you know, voters don't detect more subtle problems. If, the, if a problem is totally obvious, then the voters will know that it's bad. But if there's some problem that it's a little bit difficult to figure out what the cause of it is, or if there's a long-term problem that you have to plan for ahead of time, then uh, they're not good with that. So you have things like the deficit. Um, well, it's going to cause it just causes problems down the road. The government borrows a bunch of money, but in the short term, during the time that the politicians who borrow the money are in office, um, you know, it benefits it benefits the government and the people who are receiving the government benefits. It's just that future generations just have to keep paying the interest on and on. So democracies are not good with that, right? Because it's like, um, you know, the politicians, the politicians are not going to plan for what's going to happen 20 years later when they're not in office. Let's face it, politicians rarely suffer any um, consequences for their actions, unless, you know, the worst is them getting voted out. You know, yeah. And, you know, I mean, because they I, I talk all the time about qualified immunity for police officers. I mean, there's no better qualified yeah. immunity than for politicians. They, yeah, they don't suffer any right, yeah. of the consequences. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, um, I mean, one of the problems is that uh, voters have no idea what's going on. Right. Um, now, so if a politician did something especially outrageous, then the voters might hear about it. But the things politicians do in the ordinary course of events, like. You know, when I ask people, hey, do you know what was the last thing that your congressman voted on? Nobody ever knows, right? So the voters are not even going to know if you make a bad vote, right? Almost certainly. There's only a small number of very high profile issues where um, e even like a small number of people will know what the politician did, right? But then, yeah, I mean, I think your point is, well, you know, what if the politicians vote for some horrible thing? Like, oh, they vote to start a war and 100,000 people are killed. Uh, you know, you might think maybe the politician should be held liable for that. Like, I don't know. It could be considered a form of murder. You know, maybe they should go to prison for that. But obviously there's zero chance that that would happen. What about if somebody says, well, we have these poor people over here and I want to help them personally, but I, I don't have enough you know, means on my own to um, we should. Would it be bad to have a vote to take from other people who we know? You know, we're not going to take everything that they have, yeah. but we'll we'll take we'll take what, what, what we think they can spare and we'll make sure that these people are taken care of over, over here. I mean, that just. Seems fair, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, it seems nice, right? Um, yeah, so, but, um, you know, my point in challenging the notion of authority is well, let's apply to the state the same moral principles that you'd apply to non state agents. So, suppose that, you know, like if that's a good justification, then I should be able to do that personally. That is, so if, uh, if it's, 
morally correct to take money from somebody in, just in order to give it to charity, just because the charity is doing more good, then I should be able to just like go to people on the street, steal their money, and then give it to a charity organization. And I think the common sense moral judgment is that that's not permissible. Right? Like even, even if it's a good charity, I still can't do that. Um, you know, I can't like mug people on the street. I can't even just like pick their pockets and you know secretly or secretly divert money from their bank accounts to the charity organization. Um, so, you know, then why would it be permissible for the government to do that? And like you have to believe that the government is special, that there's some kind of like special moral status that sets um, politicians above everybody else. But again, there's just no basis for thinking that. Well, we certainly see it in society that people think that um, possibly police officers have a higher moral moral uh, compass than we do. I mean, yeah. like you've pointed out that some people, if you say that you think a law is immoral and you're not going to follow it, that always triggers other other citizens who, you know, well, I'm going to follow that law. So you have to. Yeah. Well, so um, you might think, I mean, you could think of different examples of, of laws that would be unjust. So let's say there's the drug laws, uh, which I take to be unjust because um, they interfere with somebody's right to control their own body. Okay, so suppose there's somebody who wants to use drugs, but they're not doing it because it's illegal and they want to respect the law. Okay, and then I go and I start using the illegal drugs. Um Okay, and the thing that a political philosopher might say is, oh, this is unfair. You know, you're getting to use the drugs that you want to, and these other people are not getting to use them because they're respecting the law. You should respect the law, too, out of fairness. Okay, well, I agree that there's an unfairness going on, but the complaint should be against the state, right? It's like the person who's using the illegal drugs, like it's not that person's fault. It's the state's fault. You know, like the guy who wants to use them but is not using them, he should blame the state for the fact that he's not able to use them. He shouldn't blame the other people who are breaking the law. Um, right now, you know, I should say I, I do not advocate using drugs. They're not good for you. <laughs> OK, but but uh, it is your right to control your own body. Right. So, you know, it's not not a wise decision, but it is it is within your kind of moral rights. Um, you might think about something like taxation. So if somebody is, is evading their taxes, you might think, well, that's unfair to the rest of society because it's actually making the rest of society worse off. They actually have to pay more taxes uh, if one person is evading their taxes. Um, so is that unfair? Um, well, I mean, it's unfair, but is the unfairness to be blamed on the tax evader or to be blamed on the state, right? Yeah. Um, if you think that taxation is actually just, then, yeah, it is, it is unfair, and then you should blame the guy who's not paying his taxes. Um, if you think it's unjust, then you should just you know, blame the state. Right? It's like, you know, I, you know, imagine if we were talking about anybody other than the government, right? So, you know, um, the mafia is extorting money from people, and then there's one person who's evading the mafia extortion. He's not paying the amount that the mafia is demanding. And then the mafia demands more money from other people. Okay, who whom do we blame in this scenario? It's like obviously you would blame the mafia people. You wouldn't get mad at the person who's not paying the extortion money. Well, what we've talked about so far is basically, if I could sum it up in my own words, is I have no authority over you. No group of people that I get together have authority over you. And if we call ourselves a government, we have we, still our authority over you is illegitimate. So if we look at the way society is built right now with the government, police, all this as being an illegitimate authority, what would a society with no authority, with someone not having authority over another person look like? Yeah, so... You know, like uh, one of the things that's good in the social contract is kind of the moral, the moral theory that's behind it is good. Like the idea that people should just make voluntary agreements with each other, right? That's sort of like the underlying moral perspective. It's just factually wrong. 
it's you know factually false that you have such a voluntary agreement with the state. So um, the really just society would have actual contracts. Like if you need to be protected from criminals, you would hire somebody with a real contract. Like it would be on paper and it would say, okay, this is what we're going to do. You know, we're going to provide whatever. We're going to patrol this building or something. And uh, here's how much it's going to cost. And then both parties would sign it, right? Um, the view of anarchists is not that there should be no law and order. It's that the functions, like the good functions the state is providing should be privatized. So protecting people from uh, robbers and murderers and so on, that, sh that function should be privatized. It shouldn't be eliminated, meaning there should be competing organizations. And they should only take your money after you've agreed. Uh, you, know, you choose the one that you want to protect you and you make an agreement with them and then you pay them voluntarily because they're providing a service. That's how it should work, roughly speaking. Um, about, uh, about the court system, that should also be privatized. So if there's a dispute between two people, like did this person really do something wrong? Did they really violate someone's rights? Uh, that should be adjudicated by you know, something like the courts, but it shouldn't be a monopoly. The problem with the current system is it's a monopoly system, right? So there's like one court system run by one organization. And uh, we could instead have, um, you know, different arbitrators who are competing with each other. And then you and the person you have a dispute with have to um, find a neutral third party and you find somebody who has a reputation for fairness or something like this. Um, the point of competition is um, if you have somebody who's like really bad – at resolving disputes in the way that the government is, like they take years to resolve a dispute and they like it costs tens of thousands of dollars for a routine dispute, that person is not going to get selected, or right? that company is not going to get selected, right? Um, and the basic reason why the government has problems like that, why they get really expensive, they take a really long time, they're just like unsatisfying uh, to the citizens, the basic reason is there's no competition because like, the, no matter how bad they get, you still can't fire them. You still, like, you don't have any alternative government to go to, so you just have to keep using them. The people that, that I know that complain most about, um, you know, when you talk about laissez-faire, and say, oh, monopolies will pop up, they just over... <laughs> they, they, they forget about the biggest monopoly of all and the one that can actually kill you, <laughs> you know, with, imp yeah. with impunity. yeah. So, you know, if you described what the government is without using the word government, <laughs> uh, I think these people would think, oh, my God, that's horrible. Like, what if there was this one corporation which it controlled a really huge industry, actually a couple of really huge industries, and it was a complete monopoly? And what if they used their monopoly power to just keep extending into other areas, right, and taking over other goods and services? And what if, like, they hired their own um, – uh, paramilitary force, right? And they would just like, you know, send men with guns around. Uh, if the customers didn't want to pay them, then they would like take those people captive and lock them in like a company building or something. Oh my God, that sounds horrible. <laughs> That's the government, right? That's what they are. They're like a huge monopoly corporation that just keeps extending their reach into other industries and, you know, other areas of life that they want to control using their initial monopoly on the security industry. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I forget my friend Dave Smith describes government as a, um, the mafia disguising itself as a human rights organization. <laughs> <laughs> Something like yeah. That. yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is like, this is, um, I think the dominant theory about the origin of government, right? The origin of government is in exploitation, not serving and protecting. Because, you know, you got to be really naive to think that the way this whole thing came about was there were some human beings who really wanted to serve and protect other human beings. So, like, they got, you know, a bunch of people with a lot of guns got together and decided to serve and protect everyone else. Um, no, the origin of government is basically, you know, a group of people decide to go and invade neighboring tribes and take them over and uh, oppress them, right, and control their resources. And then, you know, the people who the people who took over start calling themselves the government, right? And the, the, the victims whom they took over get to be called uh, the people, the, the, um, the subjects of that government. 
this was great. I really appreciate you doing it. Um, I'm going to link up to all of your books to, on Amazon, especially the one that you know, we mostly talked about today was The Problem of Political Authority, but um, your other, you have five other books. I'll make sure that those are linked up. Is there anything else you want to mention, plug? Uh, no, that's it. Uh, yeah, mainly uh, look at my books. Also, uh, you can look at my, uh, I have a blog called Fake Noose, spelled F-A-K-E-N-O-U-S dot net. And um, I post there every week. Very cool. Um, I'm going to sign off now, but don't sign off. I'm going to ask you one question, okay? Yep. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Yep, thank you. I want to thank you for tuning into the Free Man Beyond the Wall podcast. I want to thank Michael for coming on. That's it. Be back in a few days with another show. Take care and bye.